Good morning, folks. My name is Mosala, an elder here at Grace Generation Church. It is once again a pleasure for me to share God's word with you. We are continuing with our Hebrew series that we've titled Christ is Greater. And this morning we are looking at what I've titled Christ's Greater Priesthood. That Jesus Christ is a priest and his priesthood is greater. And we find our text in um, uh, Hebrews chapter 6 verse 13 to chapter 7 verse 10. And I would like to read verse 25 as well. And um, two other scriptures, it's Psalm 110 and Genesis chapter 14. And we, we won't uh, read all of them, but we'll read quite a bit of scripture. So let's read Hebrews chapter 6 verse 13 reads as follows. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself saying, surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his, of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And then chapter 7 reads as follows. <clears throat> For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to him Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. He is first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness. And then he's also king of Salem, that is king of peace. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. See how great this man was to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the spoils. And those descendants of Levi who received the priestly office have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people. That is from their brothers, though these are also descended from Abraham. But this man who does not have his, descendant, his descent from them received tithe tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. In the one case, tithes are received by mortal men, but in the other case, by one of whom it is testified that he lives. One might, one might even say that Levi himself who receives tithes paid tithes through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. And then verse 25. <coughs> uh, well let's uh, let's uh, read from uh, verse 23. The former priests were many in number, but they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Verse 25. Consequently, he is able to save <clears throat> to the uttermost, those who draw near to God through faith, through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. This is God's word, and Lord, we come to your word, and we pray that you would open our eyes, give us insights, but also, importantly, that you give us obedient hearts. We come to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And amen. 
And so this morning, folks, we are going to look at this great and difficult and intricate passage from three perspectives. Number one, we're going to look at Melchizedek himself. Secondly, we are going to look at how Jesus Christ is the greater priest in the order of Melchizedek. And then thirdly, we are going to look at the main point of what the writer of the book of Hebrews is really getting to uh, in chapter 7 in the verses that we have read. And then we will, conclude, we will conclude. But first, by way of introduction, we need to dispense with one of two ways that this book, particularly chapter 7 of Hebrews, is understood concerning the person of Melchizedek. There are people who think of this Melchizedek as a pre-incarnate Christ. In other words, there are figures in the Old Testament that are really Christ himself before he is incarnated and dwells amongst us as we see in the book of John, uh, the Gospel of John. And so they would say Melchizedek was Christ pre-incarnate. Uh, in the same way that people think of the angel of the Lord that is spoken about, it is God coming to us in the Old Testament in the form of a man before the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is one perspective. And if you hold to that perspective, then you will think of Melchizedek as some, as some, in some sense as a deity, as somebody who's got no parents, who's got no genealogy, who is living forever even now, who is in fact Christ. And the second perspective is to look at this figure Melchizedek uh, by way of typology, to say that he is a merely a type. He's just a person in the same way that, for example, David points to Christ or Joshua points to Christ. He's simply a type pointing to the antitype, which is Christ Jesus, our Lord. And if you look at it that way, then for you, you just see the, the writer of the book of Hebrews just simply saying, you would have expected in the book of Genesis for Melchizedek to have a genealogy like everybody else. But the reason why he's presented like that is because he is a type of Christ, not that he actually doesn't have a physical uh, um, parents. And... Um, to declare my uh, position up front, I, in, I'm inclined to take the latter position, that um, Melchizedek is seen merely as a, as a type uh, of Christ and not as a um, Christophany or the pre-incarnate uh, Jesus Christ. And so as we carry on, therefore, we are going to really look at this figure of Melchizedek in three ways. First of all, we're going to look at him as he's presented in Genesis chapter 14. In other words, historically. Secondly, we're going to look at him as how he is presented in the book of Psalms 110. Uh, that is to say, we're going to look at him as uh, prophetically as the psalmist look at, looks at him. And thirdly, we're going to look at this figure um, as he's presented in the book of Hebrews. Uh, that is to say, eschatologically, what does this guy say concerning this man in terms of eschatology or the end things. First, for historical context, let's look at what this figure is as he's presented to us in Genesis chapter 14. For context, I will start from Genesis chapter 10. In Genesis chapter 10, we see what is called the table of nations, the descendants of uh, of, of Noah um, and, and his uh, sons. And in chapter, and then there's 70 nations that come out of that. And many people believe that it is from those 70 that the entire uh, human population was uh, populated. And then secondly, Abram is, is presented to us for the first time in chapter 11. And it is in chapter 11 where we begin to see genealogies being spoken about as God is almost starting over after the flood. And so Abram is introduced to us. In Hebrew, the descendants, are, uh, they use the word toledot, uh, that is the descendants. And many people believe that 
world history is really recorded to us for the first time from chapter 11 of the book of Genesis. In other words, chapter 1 to chapter 10 is historical, but not in a sense that we understand history today. There's a lot of types and shadows and things like that. But actual history is recorded to us from chapter 11. And then in chapter 12, we get the blessing of Abram as he has come from Ur of the Chaldeans to Haran. God appears to him and blesses him. And then in chapter 13, well, before chapter 13, what happens with Abram is that because of famine, he goes down into Egypt and he lies to the king of Egypt concerning his wife, that his wife is his sister and so on. And uh, God protects his wife from being sexually molested and that kind of thing. And then after the famine, he goes back into what we'd call Canaan, uh, in the place called Hebron, which is in today's West Bank, and he kind of settles there. And as he stays there in chapter 13, we have a dispute between uh, Abram and his brother's son by the name of Lot, because God has blessed them, their livestock is increasing, and now they are beginning to fight, and they are, um, the guys who look after their livestock also begin to quarrel amongst themselves. And that leads to Lot saying, I'm going east. And he crosses the Jordan River. Uh, goes into Jordan, into the place called Sodom. And that is where he kind of settles. And he settles there because he thought it is looking great. And that is what he's choosing for himself. And Abram uh, remains in a, in a place called the Oaks of Mamre, a guy called Mamre who um, was an Amorite, and that is where he dwells. And so unfortunately for Lot, uh, what was happening at that time, just to con further contextualize this uh, text, um, is that the kings of this place called Canaan uh, decided after 12 years of paying tribute to Chador Lauma, they decide they are not going to pay a tribute to him anymore, the five kings rebel against him. Chador Lauma gets furious. He takes three other guys. And so it is four kings advancing from the east side of, of Damascus. They come all the way down to come and attack these guys who are refusing to pay tribute to them. And unfortunately, Lot is in the path, staying as he was in Sodom, and this guy takes him captive, takes all of his possessions, and then just goes right down on the other side of the Dead Sea and right up back to where he came from. And then um, Abram hears that his nephew Lot has been uh, taken captive and he's lost all of his possessions, and he decides... I'm going to have to do something <laughs> and I need to rescue this guy. And he, uh, with three uh, allies, a total of 318 men, decide that they are going to advance against Chadr Lauma. And then he catches up with him just before Damascus and a massive fight ensues. And surprise, surprise, Abraham who is then Abram, he becomes Abraham in chapter 17 of Genesis, he wins. He and his band of, uh, of we won't even call them soldiers, uh, uh, you know, they are, uh, they are engaging in guerrilla warfare, and they, and they win. And they bring this incredible wealth with them that they have taken from their enemies. And then as he comes back, then he meets two characters, and these two characters could not be more different from one another. The first character that he meets on his way back is this figure, Melchizedek. And this Melchizedek uh, blesses God, that's number one. Number two, Melchizedek um, gets tithes from Abram. And Melchizedek glorifies God Almighty. What he basically says in his prayer uh, in Genesis chapter 14, 
he basically says, God owns it all. And then he says, as for you, Abram, you have won because God has decided to give you the victory. And God has blessed you. It was by grace alone that you have had the victory that you have had. And we are told uh, great things about this guy. That's to me, and I will come back to this in a moment, very, very surprising that this Melchizedek seems to be a, a Canaanite king. He was a king of a place called Salem, which later became Jerusalem. <laughs> uh, so he, that is Canaan. That is the land of Canaan. And he is the worshiper of El Elyon, the most high God. He's not a Jew. He's a Canaanite. But he's worshiping Almighty God. And not only is he worshiping Almighty God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, he uh, is a priest and he is a king. He combines these two offices in one person. So his name in Hebrew, the word Melech means king. And then Zedek means righteousness. So his name means the king of righteousness. And then again, he's the king of peace, Salem, Shalom. That's what it means. He's a king of peace. And he is a priest of the Most High God, we are told. This is a very curious story. And then the second character uh, that this guy meets, it seems like Melchizedek disappeared as before Bera, the king of Sodom, comes to meet Abram. And the contrast is like night and day. So what Bera does, what surprises me, is that he pretends that he owns everything that Abram has got. Abram is coming with all the spoils of war, this massive riches. And this guy says to him, you can keep those things. I mean, you, you, don't, you don't give something that doesn't belong to you. The very fact that he's wanting to give this guy these gifts is because he is arrogating these things to himself. And, um, and Abram would have none of it. And secondly, he's a flatterer. He's, he's pretending that Abram has done this by his own great strength and as his servant, as it were. And he is wanting to give Abram the credit and he is turning Abram away from God. But Abram took an oath and he said to this guy, listen, I have made an oath to God that I will not take one cent from you. Even though you are arrogating this thing, to, these things actually belong to me. I have gone in there and I have fought and I have won. They are mine. And he's saying, but to prove that they, in fact they are mine, he's saying, my three a band of brothers who went with me, they must have their share. And he's using his authority as the rightful owner of these things to give these guys. And he says, and even my guys who work for me, my servants, they deserve their food and they deserve to be blessed and they must get their share. He says, but I'm not taking anything lest you tomorrow say that I have made Abram rich. It's very, very curious very interesting story for us and it holds uh, a, a lesson and a promise for us as well. And now secondly, let's look at this figure from the book of Psalms. Prophetically, it's, it's again very interesting that there is only two places in the Old Testament where Melchizedek is mentioned. It is in Genesis 14 and a, a thousand years later, um, the, 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 the psalmist David speaks about this particular historical passage, but he puts a prophetic spin to it. And what he's basically saying, if you look at Psalm 110, it is uh, made up of 10 verses, and it breaks neatly into two portions. Verse 1 to verse 3, it is Yahweh speaking, and he says to, uh, to my Lord, and this, my Lord, can be none other than the Messiah because it is David who is speaking as a king. It cannot be to David himself. He says, Yahweh spoke, and he, he hears and he declares this oracle that says where he had God, and this is, must be by revelation. He hears Yahweh speaking and saying and declaring 
and enthroning uh, the Messiah. He says, Yahweh said to my Lord, you, uh, today you are a priest forever, um, and so forth. So verse 1 to verse 3, it is enthroning the Messiah as the king. And then from verse 4 to verse 7, um, then he speaks about uh, the same king being a priest, and he swears an oath this time. It's not an oracle this time, but it is an oath. God swears, and he says, this very king, God swears that he is a priest. And David essentially says, Melchizedek was a prophetic picture that is pointing beyond himself and is pointing towards the Messiah. In that even though according to the law, the priests came from the tribe of Levi, the kings came from the tribe of Judah, but Melchizedek is a type, it's a shadow, it's a picture of what God is going to do in the future. He's going to bring these offices together, the, priest of a, the office of a king and the office of a priest together, and God swears by oath that that is going to be the case. And this leads us to Jesus as a superior priest as he's presented in Hebrews chapter 7. Very interestingly, the author this time is looking at this historical piece in Genesis chapter 14, but he is looking at it through the lens of Psalm 110, the prophetic lens, but now this time he's saying this is eschatological. This has been fulfilled in the person and ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, uh, without much ado, one can get very bogged down by all these technicalities in this book, but I want to really cut straight to the chase and say, what is the point that he's making? What is the point of all the story about Melchizedek and these historical things and these prophetic elements? And the real point is pointed out to us in verse 25, chapter 7, verse 25. It reads as follows concerning Jesus and how Jesus is superior priest. He's superior to the Levitical priesthood. He's the priest in the order of Melchizedek. It says the following about him. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. Let's break that down into three smaller points. Point number one, Christ is able to save forever. He is saying that Christ is able to save forever because Christ is a king and he is a king of righteousness like Melchizedek. He's not a king over a particular real estate, over a particular uh, land, but he's the king of righteousness. He comes as a king who is righteous. His scepter is a scepter of righteousness. And he rules and he overcomes enemies. That's what the office of the king in the Old Testament was meant to, to do. The, the, the king had to be amongst the warriors. And the scent of the king was... Uh, supposed to inspire them to warfare and to rout all of their enemies. And now the rest that I say to these guys who are trying to go back into Judaism, he says, what are you doing? You are wanting to go back into the kings of Israel who are inferior? Here is a greater king, Jesus, as the son of man. We are reminded here of what, what he, he tells us in, in chapter 1, that God said concerning Jesus, you are my son, today I have begotten thee. The enthronement of Jesus Christ and how it was carried out in his resurrection and his session at the right hand of the Father. How, where Jesus Christ is sitting not as a mere man, but as the very son of God and as a king 
So he's saying to us, Christ is king and he's able to save us forever. Secondly, he's saying to us that he always lives to make intercession for us, the people of God. That is meant to highlight to us his, the, the priestly side of his kingship. He is the king of righteousness. He's able to satisfy God's righteous requirements. But secondly, he is a priest. The priests were uh, intercessors. They were the go-betweens. They were the advocates. They were the ones who comes to bring reconciliation between God and man. And so we are told Jesus Christ uh, ever lives to make intercession. He's got the power of indestructible lives. The Levitical priests used to go only once into the most holy place uh, to offer sacrifices, and they were limited by death. Year after year, and as soon as the king dies, somebody, a, a, a priest dies, somebody else must be appointed. And if he's an unrighteous king, he's going to die in the presence of God. And the sins of the people will not be cleansed and forgiven. But we are told we have a different priest here who has got indestructible life because he is God and man in one person. He has got the power of indestructible life. He lives forever to make intercession for us. In other words, he brings us reconciliation with the Father. And then the third point is that it is for those who draw near to God. I think this is a statement of purpose. Why is Jesus Christ this king priest in the order of Melchizedek? Why does he come and he reigns and he destroys all of our enemies? Sin, Satan, the world, and the whole lot. And why is he having this priesthood that is forever and where he's able to make intercession? The point is to draw us near to God. We are not saved uh, merely to escape uh, the wrath of God, not saved merely to go to heaven. We are saved so that we might be drawn near to God, so that we might have fellowship with God. And Jesus Christ makes that not only possible, but actual through his uh, death, burial, resurrection, and his continuous office of a mediator and an intercessor for us. And so the point here is to say, guys, or, or rather let me say, th say it this way, what are we saved from? If you look at this, the answer is that we are saved from the wrath of God. What is the biblical answer to dealing with the wrath of God? The biblical answer is the office of a, not only a king, but a priest, priesthood. And so the point of the writer of Hebrews is, look at how great a priest you've got in the person of Jesus. It is almost as if he's reminding us what he said earlier. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation how is it that you want to go back into inferior priesthoods jesus christ is the superior priest and he is our only hope of salvation and so john piper says the following which i think is absolutely wonderful he says this is the love of god rescuing us from the wrath of god in such a way that the justice of God is vindicated and the glory of God is exalted. Only Jesus Christ could do that. It is the love of God rescuing us from the wrath of God in such a way that the justice of God is vindicated and the glory of God is exalted. And there can be no one who can do that other than our Lord Jesus Christ. So I want to conclude with these words that our future salvation depends not merely 
on the passive work of Christ, what he did in the cross. But it depends on his active work. We are told that he is able to save us forever because he ever lives. There is never, ever, ever going to be a time where your sins are going to be brought up against you if you have been brought near to God through the person of Jesus Christ. Because he is a king indeed. He is a priest. He lives forever and he pleads your case forever and ever. And secondly, I think the point of this book is to say to us that our salvation is secure. And the reason why it is secure is because of Christ's indestructible life. He lives forever. Therefore, my salvation is as secure as the life of Jesus Christ endures forever and ever. It is as secure as the indestructible life of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us therefore draw near to God with boldness to obtain grace and find favor even in the sight of God. And so Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the superior priesthood of Jesus in the order of Melchizedek. We thank you that you didn't just save us one time in history, but you continue to stand in the presence of the Father for us. And we thank you that our salvation is secure, as secure as your life is indestructible. And I pray that we, this would encourage us to draw near and to enjoy fellowship with the Father. In Jesus' name, amen.